joining us today. We are so glad you're tuning in. Text us using the number at the bottom of the screen to let us know you're watching, if you need prayer, or if you just want more information. You can also visit us online at truenorthak.org. You reign in all the earth. You reign 
church
on church lift your voices I can feel it and there's revival in the church oh and There is hope in your name, God. Everlasting hope, eternal hope. We put all our faith and our trust in you, Jesus. the victory no matter the battle we're going through 
We thank you that your name is like no other name, that when we whisper it, your presence is there, that when we shout it out, your presence is there. God, we thank you that we can count on you, that a miracle is in the works, that you're a life-giving God, and we can go back to the grave, which we're going to celebrate in a week, Easter Sunday, but today is Palm Sunday. Today is when they celebrated you in the Bible, they say, in Jerusalem. They laid out the palms and the trees, and, they, and you rode in as the King of kings and the Lord of lords back then, and that's who you are today. We thank you, Jesus, that there is hope in your name. And as we continue to worship in just a few moments by receiving of your word, let us be joyful in doing so in your mighty name. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. Would you turn to someone and say, hey, man, it's good to read church. Or hello, lady, it's great to be here. If you're watching online, we're so glad you tuned in. up your invite cards and car decals in the foyer. Who are you inviting to Easter at True North? For more details, be sure to check out your worship guide. Oh, you sounded like first service, like you just woke up. How's everyone doing today? There we go. That's a little better. Thanks. Hey, I need your help. We live stream our second gathering in correctional facilities as well as those watching online at home. Would you give it up for those that aren't here today watching? And, and uh, we're so glad that you joined us. And next week's Easter. You, are you ready? Yeah. Man, you got your Easter egg can, can. Hopefully you got your eggs to die. All those things at Easter, you know, we've made it in our homes. Um, next week here in the church, I need a couple. I need your help. We, here's, a, here's a challenge, True North. Our, our sanctuary would seat more people than our parking lot holds, okay? And so next week, we'll have some off-campus remote parking. There'll be some signs around here. If you'd help us, I don't think they're going to get the snow. I don't think all the snow is going to melt this week, but pa park on the back road back here if you want. There'll be a couple paths carved through if you could help us. Also, our first gathers at 8 o'clock here on this campus. If you could make help us fill up 8 o'clock. The other ones, it'll it create some space for other people. Also, a Wednesday night is actually our Easter service. And I had someone say, Mark, you can't celebrate Easter on a, on a Wednesday. Easter's not an event. Easter is a person. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a person, not an event. Okay, we celebrate it on a certain, certain day. But if you come on Wednesday, your seat can be saved. for so We're expecting about 22 to 2,400 people to come out on Easter. And so you can help us if you, if, if you come early, sit in the front rows. There's not a pass. I'll be the only one up here. You can sit right in the front row if you want. Come early. Um, and again, there'll be some shuttle parking available. Um, hey, do, 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 do me a favor. We're in a series called Like a Good Neighbor. So look at your neighbor right now. It's good to see you. Look at your other neighbor and roll your eyes. <laughs> How many of you ever been somewhere before? Where, well, that's what happened. It's like I was in an event two years ago, and, and one of my spiritual sons, his name is Tyler. Tyler pastors a church of about 5,000 people in Tacoma, Washington. I was his youth pastor, and I mentored him. And he was on staff at this church later on, and the senior pastor uh, that made some poor choices found himself not pastor. And Tyler was actually voting at this church, so he took over this thriving, incredible campus, all this church. I'm in an event with him. I'm talking with him, and we're just catching up. I hadn't seen him in years, and I'm saying, how's it going? And uh, this other gentleman walks up with John Maxwell. John Maxwell, some of you have heard of me. He's a great leadership developer or whatever. And this pastor walks up. Hey, Tyler, I want to introduce you to John, and gets to be between me and Tyler introduces him to John Maxwell. I'm sitting here like, hi. Can I play ball with you? I got to, I'll give you gum. I'll be your friend. Remember that you ever been somewhere where you felt like you were, they call that marginalized. Anyone ever felt marginalized? Anyone ever felt overlooked? Anyone ever felt like, oh, I, I guess I'm not the beautiful one, the fast one, the cute one, the, 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 the wealthy one. And, and, and so I want to talk about this thing this idea today about how do, we, how do we reach the people 
other people overlook. Marginalized people. To be marginalized, the definition is to be pushed to the fringe, to be ignored, to be treated as unimportant or powerless or be sidelined or overlooked or disregarded. And, and Jesus has commanded us to love all people. Say all. all. All people. He commands us to love the ones that are in the crowd and those that feel like they're marginalized. And, and, and I don't know, I don't know if you understand, we live in a culture there's a lot of people right now in our culture that feel marginalized. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment and, and, and the types of marginalization. Um, but the Bible says something. The, the Bible says that mercy, in James chapter 2, mercy triumphs over what? Judgment. Have you ever read that before? Thought, what in the world does that mean? What does mercy mean? Mercy triumphs over judgment. What that means is God's mercy is so powerful. God's mercy is so powerful, it wipes out God's condemnation of me. This, God's mercy is so powerful, Satan's accusations just fall to the wayside. How many know that Satan, if he wants, that Satan is the accuser of the brother? How many of you guys know if you've ever done something wrong, the devil wants to remind you of what you've done, and he always makes it seem bigger than it was? He's an accuser. But God's mercy is more powerful than the accusations of the devil. God's mercy is more powerful than the judgment of other people when they roll their eyes at you like, you don't belong, you're not good enough. And God's mercy, follow me here, is even bigger than your self-condemnation. There are people in here today, people listening today online, who you, 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 you can accept that God can forgive you, but you have a hard time forgiving yourself. Mercy triumphs over Judgment. In fact, I want to walk through this idea today that mercy was a theme of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry was about mercy. Everywhere he went, he showed mercy to people, except for the church people. He kind of had a hard time with people that didn't have mercy. Now, here's the thing. If I'm a full, full, full disclosure here. My wife took a spiritual gifts test the same time I did. You ever taken a spiritual gifts test? This was like right after we got married, and I'm a type A driven, like, I know what I want, let's go there, let's make it happen, let's not, let's not fake it happen, let's make it happen. And I took, a mercy, I took the spiritual gifts test, and my wife took the spiritual gifts test, and my wife rakes like real high on mercy. I didn't have, <laughs> mercy didn't register on my spiritual gift. It was zero. So my wife, you know, I remember in Tacoma, Washington, she, she sees someone homeless. She wants to drive by and give him a $20 bill. I, I drive by a homeless guy. I'm thinking, they, there's a, there, he's sitting in front of a store that says, help wanted. And, 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 and so, I, I, now, I, <laughs> how many want to know our wives shape us? We had some staff members this week that celebrated their 49th anniversary. And I asked Nels, Pastor Nels, I said, Nels, so, so uh, tell us the, tell us how it works for 49 years. He goes, what's the key? He goes, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Uh, again. And I love you, honey. Those three statements will change your marriage. So guys, guess what? I'm sorry. I was wrong. Again. And I love you. Those, that helps. Okay. Gospels. And there's several times where he's walking through the gospel. He's on the road. And people say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And I want to look at one of those stories today. And I think, I think that there's something we can learn from Jesus today on how to help the marginalized, those who have been overlooked in our culture, those who have been overlooked in society, those that have been overlooked around where, where they are. And so I want to look at, I want to look at this story, Matthew chapter 20, verse 30 through 34. It says, two blind men were sitting by the road. You know, um, I was think, when I was reading this, I thought, like, two blind mice, two blind, and I think about, like, you know, and there's a farmer's wife with a knife. That's not mercy right there. That's a nursery rhyme, okay? Have you ever wonder, wondered, like, why would a farmer's wife have a knife and try to hand her two handicapped mice? But we're going to look at a different story right here. Sorry. All right. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. When they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted out, Lord, 
son of David, have mercy on us. There's two blind men on the road, okay? The crowd scolded them, rebuked them, told them to shut up, and tried to get them to be quiet, but they just shouted what? What's it say? Louder. Lord, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, he stopped and looked their way Then he asked, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, we want to see, they said. Jesus felt compassion for them, so he touched their eyes, and instantly they could see. Then they started following Jesus. I don't know if you noticed all the verbs there. He heard them. He stopped. He looked their way, he asked them, what do you want me to do? And then he touched their eyes because he felt compassion. Notice they're all verbs, they're all actions. And and, and so today, I I wanna take a look at this and go, what are are five essentials? What are are five essentials we have to do to let God use us like, anyone here wanna be used by Jesus, like Jesus? How many wanna, Jesus was used by, Jesus was used powerfully to touch the world. And, and, and so how, how do we become Jesus with skin on to the people around us? Because we might be the only physical re- representati- representations of Jesus they see. So I'm gonna look at this story on five ways we can show mercy, five ways he felt compassion at two people. And, and so number one, if you're taking notes, listen for clues that people are in pain. See, here's the fact. Here's the fact. People are in pain all around us. There are people in this room right now. If you were to peel off our Sunday smiles, there's pain. In fact, people all around us everywhere, we often just don't tune ourselves in to hear the pain. So, so here's Jesus. Jesus heard them. He listened to the clues that they were in pain. In other words, we have to be on their wavelength. And here's, notice this. Two blind men, were. where were they sitting? By the side of the road. That sounds like marginalization right there. They're on the side of the road. They're not mainstream people. They're the side of the road people. They've been marginalized. And what are they doing to get attention? They're shouting to get attention. And what happens when they shout? Shame on you. Shut up. Don't say that. Do you know how busy Jesus is right now? They're getting shamed, and what they do? They shouted all the louder. And don't you realize in our culture today, there's millions of people who feel marginalized on the side of the road, and they're shouting in their pain. Maybe it's over race, socioeconomic background, gender, loss of, loss of jobs and tech, and, and they have to revamp, and they're out, of, they're out, or values are trampled on, or cultural, political ideologies, or religious backgrounds, or maybe they graduated from UAA and not UAF. <laughs> but, but for whatever reason, they're marginalized, and it says that Jesus heard them. He heard them. And I don't know if that grabs you like it grabs me, but Jesus heard their cry. He heard. He might have been the only one listening that day. And let me tell you something. If you're in here in pain today, he still hears your cries. Back in the book of Exodus, one of my favorite passages was the Israelites were crying out because of the bondage they were in. And the louder they cried, God heard their cries for help. God knows. Here's a question for you. Are you hearing the cries around you? Do you hear the shouts in our culture? Do you hear, do do you hear? Are you listening for the pain behind you and in front of you, the shouting in our culture? Solomon once in his wisdom said, if you shut your ears to the cries of the poor, your own cries will be ignored in your own time of need. 
Friends, what is he saying? He's saying if you don't want people, if you want people to hear you when you're in pain, open your ears and start hearing the people in pain around you. That's what Solomon is saying. Who do you hear? We need to begin to listen. Friends, I want to challenge you. If you want to be a good neighbor to your neighbors and be a good neighbor to the people around you, stop long enough to hear. The second essential to God using us, like Jesus, is number two. Stop whatever you're doing at that moment you hear. Stop. In verse 20, chapter 20, verse 32, it says, when Jesus heard their cries, he stopped. Where? Right in the middle of the road, dead in his tracks, no forward motion. He's standing perfectly still. And, and, and here's an interesting thought. Just look at the Gospels at how many times Jesus would stop where he was. Woman with the issue of blood touches him, and he stops and said, who touched me? Healed her. Had compassion on her. Jesus stopped. Here, 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 here's the problem, or here's the challenge. It, 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 it is, is a, it, it, write this down, write this down. Take notes, it's in your notes here. If you want to be used by God, you must get used to being interrupted. If you want to be used by God, you have to get used to being interrupted. And it, it, I, I believe the number one thing that destroys mercy in our life is called busyness. We're too busy to hear. We're too busy to stop. We're too busy to take a little bit of time. Why? Because we're on the rat race of life. And we're on the hamster wheel. We're going fast. Guess what? If you're on the hamster wheel too long, you become a hamster. You become so busy, we don't have time. To become the people, God, part of spiritual maturity, spiritual formation in our lives is when we begin to realize, have mercy to be aware, to pay attention, to notice, to, but it requires that we slow down. Problem is, let me throw this out there. The problem is, if we slow down, we might have to listen to our own pain. If we slow down, we might actually have to realize that God is asking us to be a part of the solution, to not allow the propagation of the problem to keep going on. Busyness kills compassion. It's the death of kindness and mercy. We're just too busy. You see that in the story. There's a story we talk about sometimes in the, in the, in the Bible called the, the Good Samaritan. And the priest is, he, he sees a guy that's been, been, been wounded and beaten up. And the priest walks by, sees him, walks he, He's busy. Goes to the other side of the road, keeps marching on. And, and the Levite does the same thing. And then there's the Good Samaritan. Sees the, the, the hurting person, has compassion on him and helps. Sometimes we're too busy to help. Got to slow down. Paul in Philippians chapter two says, don't be so obsessed with always getting your own, your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Forget yourself long enough. In other words, sometimes you gotta forget what you're doing and, and step back and be available for God. Anyone here wanna be available to God? Because we're accountable to God. In other words, we have abilities available. We're able to be available. We have, we, 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 have, we, we have time, we have, to, we, we, were, we have account for our abilities. There's, there's, and so someday, t take, step back long enough, long enough to say, God, do I have time to stop? Because if you want to be used by God, I'll tell you right now, it's probably going to happen on a time that's not convenient. If you wait for a convenient time, you might never see it. Long enough. So we need to stop, friends, and hear. We need to stop. We need sometimes just to stop. And thirdly, write this down. We need to look past people's behavior to see their value. We need to look past people's behavior to see their value. Why is it when these people, sit, these two blind men are sitting on the side of the road, Jesus is walking by, and they scream, have mercy on me. And what, what is, what, everyone would just say, hey, knock it off. Guys, you're being loud. In other words, it's probably not the best way to get Jesus' attention. 
But Jesus doesn't look at the, in that culture, that's probably a rude way of getting attention. It is a rude way. But Jesus looks past their behavior and looks at the, at the challenges and the problems that they have, and he has compassion on them. He sees them for the value that's in them past their behavior. My, my son is eight years old, and uh, my son has a very important job at this church. In fact, he, he, he says, I'm a leader at True North, Dad. I said, what are you a leader of? I'm a leader of the video games. <laughs> in our kids' church, before service and after services, people are milling and getting a cup of coffee. Before service starts, they got some Nintendo, or I don't know what games they have. My son could tell you. He's in charge of them. But see, Pastor Cole figured something out about Fulton. You give an eight-year-old a problem to fix, or they become your problem. There's a leadership principle there. In fact, there's a book I read once that said this. People are never the problem. People have problems. The problem with our culture is if, you know, we, we, we think there's problem people out there. No, 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 no. There's people who have problems problems, and we have a God who knows how to fix those problems. The problem is sometimes we can't see past their behavior to value them the same way the Son of God would stop. Everyone else is scolding them for their pain and crying out for their blindness, and Jesus goes, what's going on? I don't see the rudeness of you loud, yelling louder to get my attention. I actually see a person behind the yell. Can you see past the irritation? Can you see past the frustration? Can you see past the, the, uh, 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 the challenges? Jesus stopped and looked. In fact, there's a pattern of Jesus stopping and looking. In Matthew 9, read it when you go home. Or go back a couple weeks ago, we preached on Matthew 9, where Jesus is known as the God who stops and looks. Matthew wrote it. Matthew says, Jesus saw Matthew, a tax collector. He's writing third person about himself. I met a guy named Jesus who stopped and saw me. Read, read the New Testament. See how many times Jesus will, will, will look and see people. In Matthew chapter nine, it says, when Jesus looked over the crowd, listen, his heart what? Broke because they were confused and aimless. You think confused people make good decisions all the time? You think people aimless make good decisions all the time? It says they're wandering like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they're not living the way they were created by God to live, but Jesus saw them with compassion and realizes, yeah, they have problems, but they're not problem people. And I'm a God who if they have a shepherd, I know that they'll feel safe. If they have purpose, I know that there'll be something on the inside that resonates and they'll realize that they, that, that, that they were made in the image of the Almighty God and they're made by God and for God. And so, so, so the question for you today is this, what do you see when you see people? Think about it. What do you see when you see people? Mercy always begins when you stop, you listen, and you look. You take the time, stop. Get past the irritation. Here's what I know. Attention is love. Let me say it this way. People spell love, T-I-M-E. You can give people a handout. You can give people gifts. You can give them money. But I'll tell you right now, and say you love them, but what most people really want, if the problems go deep, they don't want a handout, they want a hand up, they want time with you. And I, kids spell T, love, T-I-M, people need your attention. And when Jesus stopped, what he was saying is, I love you enough to listen. Here's the challenge. The people who feel unloved the most are often the most obnoxious and draining people to be around. That's the challenge. 
There's a book I read once called Restoring Your Spiritual Passion, and, and it was written by, by Gordon McDonald. It's a brilliant book. It talks, about, it talks about different types of people that you're around, and, and he talks about we all have very important people. Uh, and you ever have those people, you can be around them for two minutes, and when you, when you get off the phone or get out of the presence of their company, you feel like you can walk on water. You know what I'm talking about? Like two minutes with them. And you're like, yeah, give me squirt guns. I'll go to hell. We'll put the fire out. Woo! You no know time out. Two minutes with them. And then, you, then there's people you look at and go, oh, I want to take a vacation. Right? You know what I'm talking about? The book talks about the most draining people. The people that if you were to put a sound next to who they were, they sound like a vacuum. And they're sucking life out of us. The problem is this, friends. Look at me. The problem is you need people around you that pour energy and life into you, but you can't neglect the people over here that need hope and life. And oftentimes, they're the ones that are the most obnoxious. They're screaming. They're shouting. Extra grace is required, but Jesus stopped and had compassion on those people. You can't marginalize them. You can't keep them on the side of the road forever. Some, but here's the challenge. You can't have only those people in your life or you're gonna be tired, burn out, and probably something called codependency might get developed and all this other stuff. But the, 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 the challenge here is this, is we have, to, we, we, we have to stop, and I want you to stop and think about this statement for a second. The people who need our love the most are probably the most difficult to love. But they need our love. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 21, it says, it is sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind. And that word despise is to demean, insult, put down, think that you're better than. Here's a question for you. Who do you, who, who do you or I secretly think we're better than? Because I think we can kind of do that in our culture. We look around the room. And, okay, what group do I fit? And you can kind of profile people. And, 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 but here, here, write this down. You can't look out. You can't look out for people if you're looking down on people. You can't look out for people when you're looking down on them. In other words, ask God, God, help me to stop, to look, to listen, and to understand that I value them more than the behavior that they have attached to them right now. I'm gonna love them just the way they are until they become everything that God dreamed of them to become. Number four, and I, I gotta keep going here. I took a little longer on some other points. Ask people, number four, ask people what they need. Don't assume you know. Ask people what they need. Don't assume you know. See, sometimes we look out and go, oh, what they need is this and this and this. Ask them what they need. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus stopped. He looked their direction he fixed his eyes on where they were, and then he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? You know what he did? He let the person in pain set the agenda. He let the person set the agenda. He, he, asking questions to people around you is another way of showing respect for people and their dignity. Ask for their ideas. Ask them how you can help. And, and, and the Bible says, they answered, Lord, we want to see. And so what does he do? He reaches out and he touches them. But, but let the person in pain set the agenda. In other words, let's not assume we know how to fix the people around us. What someone thinks they need might be different than what we think they need. And don't make assumptions. When you make assumptions, you make a blank out of you and me, right? And so we don't want to make, we don't want to assume. And number five, number five, do Whatever you can to help. Jesus felt compassion, verse 34, for them. So he touched their eyes and instantly they could see. I love that because years ago, when remember when cell phones first came out? Some of your kids are like, no, they've always been out. No, they haven't. Okay? When they became affordable, AT&T, reach out and touch someone. Jesus was their spokesperson. He reached out and he touched people. But, but he, he touched their eyes and instantly they could see. Jesus used his ears in this picture. He used his eyes. He used his words. 
He used his hands to show people they were loved. In other words, friends, listen, there's more than one way to show. Let, let's be people who listen. Let's be people who see. It's people who ask, stop long enough to ask, how can we help? What do you need? Are, are we willing to reach out and touch people? In Matthew 25, Jesus uh, uh, is interacting, and, and let me just read something here. It's not on the screen here, but it says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom I've prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when I was hungry, he says, for when for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the rights answered him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something? When did we see you? a stranger to invite you in, needing clothes and clothing. When do we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? In other words, and then he says this, the king replied, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers, whatever you did for the marginalized, you did for me. And I, I, I wanna just leave this thought with you for a second. Could it be the sum of the spiritual maturity and formation in our life is hindered if we don't minister to people who are marginalized. Why? He said, you saw me when you clothed me. You saw me when you fed me. You saw me when you, when, when you visited me. You saw me when you came to visit me in prison. And they go, when did we see you in prison? When did we see you? When did we? And he goes, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. But another thing I think he's saying is there's aspects of me you don't see unless you see people. In other words, look at me. I truly believe the part of us, we think spiritual maturity is memorizing scripture, which it is and going to all the life groups and getting a PhD pile higher and deeper in theology. But I think some of it happens when we step off our ivory towers as believers and minister to people other people overlook. And when you do that, you see a side of Jesus you never saw before. And I don't know about you, I want to see him like I've never seen him. I want to experience him like I've never experienced him, which means I might have to touch some people other people walk past all the time. I want to close with this thought. I youth pastored in Vegas for eight years, so I was a youth pastor, and we were there uh, uh, in the early 2000s when they were building a brand new high school every year. I mean, the, there's 250,000 students in Vegas, high school students and junior high students. And, and, and so I had a full-time associate youth pastor, and his task, his job, because they started new schools all the time, his job was, I don't want to see you when school's on. Your job is to raise up missionaries for the high school campuses and junior high campuses. So his job was to help stop his Bible clubs. And now he's running Young Life in Washington, the area director for the all of Washington. Incredible. With clubs and impacting people outside the local church. And that was his job. And, and, and we, had, we had these two girls that started, they, they, you know, so they were starting a new school. And we'd find out who's moving. And we'd pull them in and say, okay, you're our missionaries. And we had prayer cards for them like we have prayer cards for missionaries. And we had people in our church praying for these. Kara. Farley, not related to Chris, and Isabel Slick. Now, Isabel married a guy named Rick, and I said, you need to tell Rick to take your last name because Rick Slick would be great. <laughs> Rick wasn't game for that. Well, that Slick was a cool last name. Isabel and Kara, they, they, they developed with Eddie, our sister youth pastor, these cards to invite people to their Bible clubs and brand new school. They didn't, have, they didn't know Christian teachers yet to have a club on campus but they had a Starbucks across the street from the school. Now, how many of you wanna know, that's a smart plan to put a Starbucks across the street from a high school. And, I, I, and so they decided, let's have our Bible club in Starbucks. And I was like, yes, because we know God lives at coffee shops. Right? All those in favor say aye. Okay, all those opposed, we'll pray for you. God will heal you, you can bring coffee. Coffee's okay, it's a sacred bean. It's a legal addiction. So they started, and they, we, we, we always nicknamed, I always nicknamed Starbucks St. Arbucks. It's a church. 
And so they had their, and so they, they made these Bible club cards and they called it Breakthrough Campus Bible Study. And, and on the card it says, do you need a breakthrough? And, and, and they always went through and they, they, I taught my student leaders, look for people sitting by themselves at school, at lunch. Don't go to the people that everyone's trying to get to their lunch table. Go to the people by themselves. Go to the people that are hanging out. And so they started inviting these people to their life, to this new Bible study they're planting. They're at, 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 our, at St. Arbucks or Starbucks. And, they're, and so, so they pass, they see this kid, doesn't have the best clothes, looks like a little depressed. And they invite him. Hey, you want to come? Well, I, yeah, if I'm around. They didn't know what he meant by that. But that night, that young man went home to his foster home, his fifth foster home in five years. He's a sophomore in high school. That night, he was going to commit suicide. They didn't know that. I didn't know that. This was a Monday night. He's got a pistol to his head to commit suicide. And he hears his five-year-old foster sister playing her toy piano in the room next door and says, now's not a good time because he realized if he was to kill himself, she'd be the first to find him and that wouldn't be fair to her. So he puts the gun down, puts his hand into his pocket and guess what he feels? An invite card to break through campus. Do you need a breakthrough? He goes, yeah, I need a breakthrough. So he shows up at Starbucks the next day, the first week of school, and he's the first convert in the Bible club. He gives his life to Jesus. Because how many want to know Jesus loves the marginalized. Jesus loves the orphan that has no home. Jesus loves. And, and <laughs> I know Rudy because Rudy came to church. Monday, he gets an invite card, suicidal. Tuesday, gives his life to Jesus. Wednesday, comes to a youth group. And I said, does anyone have a God story? And, and this guy comes up and says, I've, he found a tribe of people that loved him for the first time. It was called Youth in, in Church. Now, let's just say, I, I just want to say right now, True North, we better be that tribe that loves the marginalized and not be the tribe that says, oh, stay over here in a corner. You don't smell like God. You don't look like God. You make poor decisions. You don't fit here. Uh, quit screaming through your pain. We better be the place that says, you can scream as loud as you want because we know the God who hears, and we hear too. And we want to help. That's the type of people we are. That's why we say invite card. People just take it in. You don't know the power of an invite to Easter. You have no idea what people are walking through. No idea. Maybe you're here today. You're watching online, and you're of that tribe that you don't know even how. You don't even know if you can scream anymore because you're too tired of the pain. Maybe you're here. You've never tried Jesus, or you tried Jesus, and he didn't work. Well, no, you don't try Jesus. You try broccoli. You try asparagus. You try sardines. You commit your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. And I want, I, I want to learn what it's like to be a son and daughter of the Most High God. If you're here, you're watching online, you're far from God. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you backslid. We're not promised tomorrow. At 5.30 this morning, I was talking to a woman who lost her son to a drug overdose last night. I prayed with her this morning. We're not promised tomorrow. We don't know when we shout through our pain, whether it's manifested through drugs or alcohol or relationships or, 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 or whatever. We don't know where it leads, but I know this. There's someone in Jesus who hears your cry and hears your pain. And if you're here today, you're listening today, and you're far from God, I've got good news. Jesus is one prayer away. What a fantastic service. If something in today's message moved your heart and you would like to pray with someone, you can text ABC to the number at the bottom of your screen and someone will reach out to you soon. And be sure to stay in touch by following us on social media so you can stay up to date with all that is happening at True North Church.